My name is Vladislav Tankov. I'm the software developer at JetBrains. I'm working on a few different projects. One of them is Kotlin, Kotlin Serverless Framework. Uh, I'm expect that some of you have some expectations, and I think I should reveal that Kotlin is not used in the new product that will be announced today, but still it is kind of a cool technology, and we'll see if it can be used there. Um, I expect that most of you know what Kotlin is. At least we are on a Kotlin conf conference, which is a conference for Kotlin, a lot of Kotlin words there. Uh, but I'm not sure that all of you know what serverless is. So who ever did anything with serverless infrastructures? Okay, a lot of people know what serverless is. <laughs> but still, I will remind about it uh, a little bit. Uh, what is serverless, when it should be used, how it is constructed, it is kind of a naive um, definition of serverless for those who never heard about it and for some reason is on this talk. Um, so as we know from Wikipedia, serverless is a cloud computing execution model in which the cloud provider runs the server and dynamically manages the allocation of matching resources. And uh, Wikipedia never lies, so it is true. Uh, cloud computing execution model that manages the allocation of machine resources. In general, it means that uh, in serverless infrastructures, your application that is deployed to some managed runtime is managed for you. It is scaled up automatically, it is scaled down automatically. Um, in case of fault, it is respinned automatically, and so on. When we talk about serverless, we need to understand the building approach. And it is pretty simple. There are three simple steps of building a serverless application, also very naive. First of all, we take small elements, stateless functions, and uh, by stateless I mean that they have no state, global state, static variables, or anything else. Uh, you have only parameters that are arguments of function, you do something with them, and returning some value. This is kind of a stateless function. Then we take events uh, and compose with those events uh, our stateless functions into an application. Events are pretty known, pretty popular programming concept. You may see them everywhere in mobile frameworks, in UI frameworks, uh, any, anywhere. So I think everyone understands what is this. In the end, we take our function-based event-driven application, a lot of buzzwords, and deploy it to cloud runtime. In general, it uh, may be not only cloud runtime, but also any managed runtime. So you can deploy your application, serverless application, uh, into AWS, but you can also deploy it to some service that DevOps of your team uh, are managing for you. And uh, if they have some automation to scale up and scale down your application, your functions, and uh, perform all the event uh, dispatching inside this application, it is kind of a serverless too. So we might take a look at this pretty complex example of a serverless application. To understand it better, we have uh, an HTTP application that responds by, from REST API. We have two users. Do you see a red site? I hope. Yes? OK. Uh, we have a user that requests slash A, and the REST API of our cloud provider uh, handles it and uh, transforms an HTTP request into an event of HTTP request to slash A and dispatches it to stateless function or lambda. Uh, in, well, in reality, AWS lambdas, it is kind of a trademark, but uh, in general, everyone is using stateless functions and lambdas as, as equivalent, term, equivalent terms. So it dispatches slash A handle request to Lambda, and this Lambda may use some other cloud resources, kind of a DBs, a dynamic DB in case of AWS. It may asynchronously call other Lambdas and so on. Our user slash Z request slash B also goes through the REST API. It translates the HTTP request into HTTP event that will be handled by Lambda that handles slash B. It will synchronously call other Lambda and will return some response to REST API. And back, REST API will re, uh, kind of transfer an HTTP event of a response into a real response to the user. And the user is waiting for the response of the request on REST API. As we see, 
in general, you can build really complex serverless applications. But the idea is pretty, pretty simple. And when we say that idea is pretty simple, we expect that implementation will be also really simple. Let's take a look at this example. We have here a function that has a get annotation. And uh, if you ever did any work with JAXRS like annotation, you ever wrote some Spring uh, applications, you may expect that this function will produce a get handler on slash hello world that will handle get methods and returns hello world. In general, we have a lack of context here. We don't know what the headers are, what is the MIME type, but we can assume some reasonable defaults. For example, that MIME time would, would be every, any, uh, any time is a plain text, and the headers are content length, and that's all. But right now, people deploy such functions with the approach of infrastructure as code. And how much of you people have ever heard about infrastructure as code approach? Well, also a lot of people. So as a little reminder, infrastructure as code is the process of managing and provisioning computer data centers through machine-readable definition files. In general, it means that you are writing a definition of your infrastructure in some file, um, for example, um, with the HashiCorp configuration language. Anyone heard about Terraform? Yep, great, because uh, the rest of the talk would be a little bit about Terraform too. So you are writing a definition of um, your infrastructure with some configuration language, and then you are asking infrastructure as code tool to apply this infrastructure to some cloud provider or any other thing, but in our case, cloud provider. And it will create the resources that are defined in your configuration. And the infrastructure is code as code idea, the approach is pretty cool. But with infrastructure as code, the building of serverless applications is not that simple as idea is. There are a lot of problems, and one of them is tons of configurations that you need to create a really simple serverless application. Here you can see a part of the definition of the a function we've seen above. For the function that I've uh, chosen as an example, you will need more than 100 lines. And uh, the function is five lines. And you need more than 100 lines. And it is not really a trivial code. You need to pretty good understand what is going on and what you are trying to create. And in case of Hello World, you just add an annotation, write in return Hello World, and everything should work. And in case of Spring, it will work. In case of several applications, you need to know also about HashiCorp configuration language, Terraform, cloud formation, nothing works, uh, what the hell, and so on. So 100 lines for this function. If you want to create a dynamic, partly dynamic, partly static site that is serverless, well, it is a real pain. And you will need more than 1,000 lines for a simple site. And uh, this is not the worst part. Since uh, if you need to create an infrastructure, an infrastructure definition, infrastructure as code tool, you need to know the exact language of this infrastructure as code tool. And the problem is that each infrastructure as code tool has its own language, its own abstractions, a lot of its own resources, and so on and so forth. So in case of Terraform, they have more than 600, uh, 60 providers. Each provider has its own resources, own data, and so on. Uh, so you will need to know a lot about cloud provider, where you are trying to apply your infrastructure, and about Terraform, to understand how you need to apply this infrastructure. Let's take a look back at our example and um, ask, ask the question, if could it, be, could it be simpler? Can we create an approach that will kind of um, understand what we want to create, what infrastructure we want to create, and uh, do it for us? So here is a pretty simple example, back, the same example. Um, we understand here that we need a REST API, and we need one handler for this REST API, and this handler should respond on get, and this handler have path slash hello world, we don't know headers, that's all. But everything else we know. And uh, in case of infrastructure as code approach, we need to duplicate all this um, knowledge in infrastructure as code file. So in a lot of cases, not only in a JAXRS-like annotations, but in, any, in a lot of more cases, I will discuss it a little bit 
later, infrastructure can be deduced from code. For example, in our case, it, uh, we can deduce that we need the REST API and the exact client block. And when infrastructure can be deduced from code, infrastructure should be deduced from code. Uh, you know, the life of the developer is already pretty complicated, and we don't want to make it more complex. We need uh, to make it simpler. So I'm introducing a term of infrastructure in code, which is application framework and deployment tool that writes the, uh, with which you are writing the code with the help of a library that provides that is provided by infrastructure in code to, you know, the difference as in, well, nicely done, I think. Uh, so you are writing the code with the help of the framework uh, that is provided by infrastructure in code to, in case of Kotlin, this kind of a library, jar library that you are using. Then during the deployment, uh, infrastructure in code to introspects the code and creates actual infrastructure for this code and deploys the application into this infrastructure. Moreover, during the um, runtime, we know that in case of AWS clouds, other clouds, you need to have your own interfaces to handle the events from the cloud. So infrastructure in code tool provides the handlers and uh, translate the events from the cloud into events inside the framework that it provides to the end user. So this is actually what is Kotlin about. Kotlin is infrastructure as code tool, and uh, the code we've seen a few times already uh, is a actual Kotlin code. This is everything you will need to deploy a REST API into AWS, and it will work as we would expect from Spring application or any other application. So Kotlin is infrastructure in code tool, in code tool for Kotlin. It has its own Kotlin domain-specific language for HTTP events. It is a set of annotations that you are using like JAX RS like annotations. It has its own Gradle, Gradle plugin for deployment of the whole infrastructure. Uh, it uses Terraform under the hood, and everyone who knows what Terraform is saying, hey, it's a major tool, I like it, but I need to write a lot of code here, and here I'm not writing any code, but it still uses Terraform. In the end, it supports now only AWS, and we know that AWS is kind of a, the biggest cloud right now, but we are aiming to support also Azure, Google Cloud Platform, some open source, uh, some open source alternatives, and so on. I will show you a brief demo of Kotlin's application. And I hope it will not fail. So we have a shot.kotlis.io. I've even bought a domain with IO, you know, real hipster. So um, we have a shot.kotlis.io. It is a normal application. We can kind of refresh it. It will work nice. Uh, we can shorten a link. It is a URL shortener. And URL shortener shortens the links. And it will even work, I hope. It works. And it's not providing a recursion. It's not. Um, it's not a recursion. Let's take a look at the code. We will need a presentation mode here. So we have um, Gradle. And some of you may not like Gradle, but I like Gradle, so we have a Gradle. Uh, <laughs> um, we have a Kotlin JVM version 1.3.15. And we are applying a plugin named io.kotless with version 0, 0.1.2. Also, here is the IO and the IO.Kotless, like IO Cater, but Kotless. Uh, we have also here an implementation dependency that is dependency to Kotless Lang, a set of annotations. Let's take a look at the definition of uh, the application. We have here get annotation with uh, path slash, and it just returns HTML. Let's take a look. This is the exact this HTML. Now I will need to exit presentation mode, I think, to enable Gradle tool. Let's change a little bit our application and redeploy it. Shortless at Kotlin Conf. We have a few tasks in Gradle named Kotlin. Uh, one of them is deploy. And where we want to deploy, so we are deploying it. And uh, a little bit of magic will happen here if Wi-Fi is stable, I hope. Uh, Kotlis will automatically download Terraform files, 
then it will perform a generation of Terraform. And we can take a look at the Terraform that was generated. It, it is more than 500 lines for short.cotless.io. It is generated uh, automatically, and the end user should not ever take a look here. But in case you are DevOps, you know that uh, Terraform is a good thing and you want to use it. And uh, since we have a generate task that generates Terraform, you may reuse it, reuse Kotlin for deploying of parts of your infrastructure with generation of Terraform. Now let's take a look at the deployment procedure. It is uh, destroying and respinning API gateway and so on. We have uh, a lot of resources here. And I hope I've changed the right thing. It respins the application right now from the Lambda, and we see shortlist at Kotlin Conf. Nice. Uh, how does it work? We have a few annotations that defines exact handlers. Uh, get annotation for root main page. Few get annotations that defines a redirect URL. It is a get method that will create a redirect, um, will, will return a redirect. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, shorten. Shorten is a get method that will perform real shortening. It will go to DynamoDB, will create uh, an alias, and will return the alias. Since uh, I'm not the best guy, I'm using get, not post. And you know it should be post. Ah, yeah, yeah. One thing. One second. Uh, back to the presentation mode. Forgot about it. So now you see, right? Uh, we have get slash shorten. And it generates slash shorten URL that will actually shorten links. And uh, each call to slash shorten will be dispatched to this function. And uh, as you see here, we have an uh, argument. And this argument will be automatically deserialized by Kotlin. Right now, we are not supporting generation of schemes for API Gateway uh, to automatically validate what URLs are, but we may support it in the future. We have a redirect URL that will perform actual redirection, and all these handlers will be used will be used by API Gateway and will be created automatically, as well as the API Gateway resources for them, REST API resources. Uh, also, we have such thing as static static get annotation. You know, when you have uh, static resources, it is a waste of resource to um, serve them using lambdas, since you have only one file and you need to return it to the user, it never changes, and so on. So Kotlin solves this thing, uh, creating actual static resources that will be connected to REST API. In case of AWS, we are using S3 bucket objects that will be connected to API Gateway, and API Gateway will be, will be serving uh, bucket objects right from the S3. So this is pretty much everything I want to say right now about Kotlin. Let's get back to the presentation. So the question is, how does it work? Here is the pipeline of Kotlin. Uh, we have a Kotlin domain-specific language. Uh, it is a annotations you've seen. Uh, using Kotlin parser, it is a plugin to compiler that used by Gradle plugin. We are parsing the domain-specific language and understand what is the actual infrastructure that is needed for this application. And you may see here that, uh, in general, this approach is not uh, kind of a limited only by serverless applications. With uh, the same approach, we can understand, for example, what is the Docker file for our application or anything else. Then we are generating Kotlin scheme. It is a cloud agnostic scheme that is uh, defining in a common terms uh, the serverless application, saying that is the stateless function, that is the handler, that is the REST API resource, and so on. And then scheme is used by uh, Kotlin engine that generates Terraform. And the Terraform is applying Terraform files into AWS, and everything is good. Uh, what this pipeline gives us? First of all, we are using cloud agnostic scheme, and it means that, in general, we can generate not only AWS deployments, but Azure deployments, Google Cloud Platform deployments, IBM deployments, or anything else. Secondly, we have an abstraction of deployment. As you may see, we are using only scheme, during the generation, so we can generate not only Terraform code, but also CloudFormation code, or Pulumi code, or any, anything else, uh, any else infrastructure as code. code. Even we can generate serverless.com code, uh, if you have a question about it, but um, it's kind of our uh, 
nature enemy, so <laughs> we would not do it. Uh, after it, we are generating Terraform and applying it. In the end, we have a pretty interesting thing. We have an abstraction of domain-specific language. As you may see, we are using only scheme during the generation of infrastructure. And uh, the only thing that knows how is defined actual application is Kotlin's parser. And uh, in general, it means that we can replace parser with any other parser and uh, kind of a parse some other domain-specific languages. Uh, so emerges the question, why not support existing framework? Why should we reinvent things and uh, add in new JAX RS-like annotations? And we do support existing framework, we support Cater. So we can generate uh, serverless Cater deployments. And I hope some of you know what Cater is. Okay. <laughs> not as much as Terraform, not, but any. So we have uh, pretty much the same build Gradle KTS. I hope everyone is using Kotlin script in Gradle. And uh, today Andre showed that uh, auto completion now works a lot faster, so it is not pain anymore uh, as it was. We are redefining the type of DSL, saying that we will uh, parse Kater files, and we are using Kater hyphen lang. And this is an implementation of Kater engine that is used by Kotlin that, and that is optimized for, optimized for serverless deployments. I know that a lot of people right now, some people right now, are deploying actual Kater server into serverless, kind of a um, pruning things out of it and trying to make it work in lambdas. So we are implementing our own engine that is lightweight and that will do only the work that is needed during the serverless runtime. We have uh, as an entry point a Kotlin class, Kotlin mm, abstract class or interface, I don't remember. So we have uh, as an entry point Kotlin class and it has one, exactly one, Entry point function, fun prepare, that returns you a simple Kata application. On this application, you can set up uh, the get handlers, post handlers with the Kata uh, DSL, and everything will work. We are using here static feature of Kata that will generate static resources, and we are using uh, dynamic handlers with get, post, and so on. So, what happens after it is that Kotlin is uh, introspecting application, finds the methods of uh, Kata that are known by him, and generates actual infrastructure. And uh, as I said, this approach is, um, can be kind of a generalized, and we can support not only Kata in this way, but also Spring or any other framework. We need to just kind of a change a little bit parser, say to him that uh, now you are parsing not annotations but uh, get methods or anything else, and it will generate infrastructure for Kater or Spring or any other thing. Yeah, ba back to the presentation. Oh, oh, I didn't show you, but Kater application is also deployed, so I'm not lying. You can see it at kater.shot.kotlis.io. I have a good imagination. Uh, and it should also work. And we have here powered by Kotlin and Kata. So let's get back. Mm. The idea of um, creating serverless infrastructures of um, for existing frameworks brings us the idea of um, a few domain-specific languages that can be used during the parsing. And it brings us to the idea of a seamless serverless. Also, I'm introducing kind of this term. Um, in this concept, you are writing the web, uh, the code with any web framework you like. But if you are using Kotlin, you are writing it with Kater, and you are it means that you like Kater, uh, at least right now. After it, you can run it locally, since um, you have um, actual Kater deployment. We can uh, actual Kater code. We can replace the engine the, with the engine that can be used locally, and you can debug your application locally, run it locally, even have a host solution standalone. Then you are deploying it with a seamless serverless uh, tool like Kotlin. 
It introspects the code of your framework, understands what is the serverless infrastructure for it, and generates, generates uh, deployment and deploys it. In the end, you have a serverless application in the cloud, and you can even have a standalone application in-house. So it may be interesting and, uh, well, important for those who are willing to have uh, not only cloud deployment for their application, but also a standalone application for, you know, guys that uh, kind of from army or from FBI and they want everything not in cloud, but everything at their office. You can say that, okay, guys, we have a standalone application and the serverless application works exactly the same way. Yeah, it is interesting, but let's go even further. Um, we've discussed an HTTP REST APIs, we've discussed, um, well, pretty much only it. Uh, but there exists a lot more things about serverless. First of all, uh, we all know that serverless is used for handling and events. And if you are using serverless, you may want to schedule some job, uh, use cron expressions to have some jobs scheduled and so on. You will also need a permissions granting. Since uh, Kotlin generates fully infrastructure, for your application, you will not be able to say that this exact uh, serverless function should have an access to this exact DynamoDB table. So we need to provide you with an ability to say that some objects inside your code are requiring some permissions. In general, this is not only the things that, uh, this is not the whole thing that code may fully define. In general, code may fully define API interaction. We've seen it already, it is get, post, and so on. It can define events handling, not only scheduled, but custom events from AWS, Azure, or any other thing. It can define permission requirements with annotations, or in some cases, we can kind of deduce things and understand that you are using DynamoDB client, and during the compile time, we can understand what is the table used here, and what are the functions that is called, and generate permissions for it. In the end, that is not yet implemented, uh, we may understand that you are using shared structures. Uh, it means that if you have, for example, two scheduled functions, one of them is popping uh, values from the queue and other is pushing values for, to the queue, we understand that your functions are not really stateless and they will not work in the way you expect. So uh, in this way, in, in this case, uh, you will have one uh, function since it's stateless, it will be popping from empty queue and other will be pushing to queue that already has a lot of items. So we understand that you want to have a shared structure and we can kind of replace in code the calls to this queue with calls to DynamoDB table, generate this DynamoDB table and make it work like a queue. In the end, uh, some calls of functions, uh, not coroutines, but still, for example, you want to call asynchronously some function and we understand that in if you are deploying it as a serverless application, you would love if we would uh, capture the context of this asynchronous function, understand that you will use it inside its body, and make it a separate serverless function that will be asynchronously called and will be working, and your uh, serverless function that has been calling it asynchronously will return the value. So let's take a look at some Kotlin advanced features. Not all of them are implemented right now but some are, this is also in Kotlin's shortener. First of all, we have uh, permissions granting. It is a URL storage object that is used to push some data into DynamoDB table and pop some data from the DynamoDB table. I say that um, this object, any access to this object will require read and write permissions for table short hyphen URL hyphen table. And each stateless function is inside my application, if it will access this object, will be granted with permissions to read and write to this table. Also, it can be uh, kind of applied to some functions, and you can uh, granularly, uh, granularly uh, separate permissions and say this function is only reading from the table and this function is only writing to the table. And if your stateless function is only reading from the table, it will be granted only with permissions to read from the table. Also, we have schedule functions. This function is used inside a shortless URL shortener to clean up the storage of URLs 
it will uh, clean up all the URLs shortened each three hours, since this example is okay. Uh, and we have here scheduled annotations that defines uh, a behavior of um, running each hour for this handler. And we can have here any argument since um, we don't know what the arguments from the context. Yep, and one interesting detail, uh, it is extensions.cf. Uh, Kotlin right now is not able to express fully what Terraform is um, providing you. For example, we cannot create, I don't know, Cognito, we cannot create DynamoDB tables, and we are not aiming to replace Terraform or CloudFormation or any other thing. We are trying to make deployment of serverless applications simpler. And if you need, will need to create DynamoDB tables with some DSL, uh, it may be even more complicated tasks than uh, just use Terraform. So Kotlis provides you with the ability to define that some Terraform files are defined in your project and should be used during the deployment also. So uh, with this, I'm creating DynamoDB table for URLs with extension and defines in build Gradle KTS that is the extension to generate a Terraform file. Let's get back to the presentation. So I've uh, kind of uh, defined uh, all the aspects of Kotlin right now. What's next? We are working hard on different things. First of all, it is supporting of other clouds. We are aiming to support Azure. We are aiming to support Google Cloud Platform. But it is um, really connected to the second point, supporting of Kotlin multi-platform projects. You know that Kotlin, uh, Kotlin provides you with uh, different targets, different runtimes. You may generate JavaScript code, you may generate native code, you may generate Kotlin code, uh, JVM code. And uh, depending on the task, um, you may need and want to use different targets. So we want to provide our users with possibility to generate uh, even JavaScript lambdas from Kotlin, native lambdas from Kotlin, and uh, JVM lambdas from, from Kotlin, uh, so they can choose the runtime. And it means that uh, we can support, for example, Google Cloud Platform, since Google Cloud Platform, as far as I remember right now, supports JVM only in beta. And JavaScript is um, um, not in beta, so if we would have Kotlin multi-platform projects, we could uh, support JavaScript or a Google Cloud Platform generating JavaScript. We aim to support extended event handling, uh, event handling of custom events in AWS or in any other platform and much more, the work on performance, the work on other things. For example, we've been thinking about performance from the start, so we have auto warming of lambdas, our lambdas optimized by size, and so on. This is practically all I wanted to say about Kotlin and its state right now. I hope that you will give Kotlin a try. Here's the QR code that navigates you to GitHub repository, and here's the my email. You may ask me with it or right now. I hope it, would, it was interesting. Thank you.